and welcome to To The Point. Lovely to have your company once again with me, Dr. Laura Richardson, and Dr. Richard Kent. Hello, Richard. Hi, it's great to be back with you again, Laura. And we have quite an interesting topic today, haven't we, Richard? This is so, so, so interesting. Um, and it's called Mount Sinai and the Garden Tomb. Now, this is interesting because for those of you who've been to Israel, um, one of the places you would have gone, well, two places you probably would have gone would be the Garden Tomb, which is in Eastern Jerusalem, the south of Jerusalem, and also the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. <laughs> um, and there is a lot of controversy about whether the Garden Tomb or the Church of the Holy or the, the place where the Holy Church of the Holy Sepulchre is, is, is where Jesus actually um, was buried for the time that he was in the ground fall. And Richard, we're going to expound on that today. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk a lot more about this conversa a conversation about Mount Sinai coming into the picture. And uh, which Mount Sinai, eh? And uh, how sure are we now about Mount Sinai, which actually is in Saudi Arabia? Yes. That, that was the place where it all happened. Well, I tell you what, um uh, Howard Blessing has just very recently interviewed a wonderful gentleman, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Do watch Howard's uh, video on uh, Mount Sinai. Now, I've actually never had the courage to actually show this particular fun fact on, to the point before, uh, but after Howard Condor, uh, the, the founder, the co-founder of Revelation TV, showed all about this particular subject himself, I thought, well, perhaps, perhaps it'd be all right to show it. So we are going to show Mount Sinai, and uh, Laura is going to read, I hope, a scripture which proves that Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia and not St. Catherine Monastery. Now, a lot of uh, tourists go to Israel and they pay a lot of money to go to St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Peninsula, and guess what, folks? That's not the right place, and Laura will tell us why. <laughs> well, this is... From the Word of God, and it comes from Galatians chapter 4, verses, verse 25. It says, This Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. So from this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Richard. Mount Sinai in Arabia, not in Israel. Arabia's the other side of the Red Sea, um, quite a long way away. Um, anyway, show the program, show, <laughs> show the thing, we'll chat about it. <laughs> we're going to chat more about it. But first of all, we're going to uh, fun fact on Mount Sinai. <laughs> Hello, my name is Richard Kent. Uh, today I want to talk about Mount Sinai or the possible Mount Sinai. I can't promise to you that this really is Mount Sinai, but one thing I can promise you is that it's not St. Catherine's Monastery, which is the place that uh, many tourists visit in the Sinai Peninsula. Why do I say that? Because the Bible is very cl clear. In Galatians 4.25 it says Mount Sinai is in Arabia. I'll say it again. Mount Sinai is in Arabia, that's Galatians 4.25. So we need to look and see somewhere in Saudi Arabia which could possibly be the original Mount Sinai. Now this is the place that uh, my close friend Derek Walker thinks is the real Mount Sinai. An acquaintance of mine, who I can't pretend to be very friendly with, but I have met him twice, Chuck Missler also believes that this is the real Mount Sinai. Sinai. First of all, it's in Saudi Arabia, and in order to get to Saudi Arabia, the children of Israel had to cross an eight-mile um, expanse of water um, at the Gulf of Aqaba. Um, we'll talk about that on another occasion. But when they arrived at Mount Sinai, uh, we, of course, we know that Moses went up to the top of Mount Sinai, and you can see there that the top of Mount Sinai is blackened. Uh, the correct name for that type of blackened granite is obsidian. What actually happened, we're told in the scriptures, is that God came down in fire and burnt the top of Mount Sinai. And actually, if you go up Mount Sinai, you'll find that uh, what it looks like molten glass. Um, it's got a blackened appearance, and that is why Mount Sinai um, has a blackened appearance. Now, 
In Saudi Arabia, it's not called Mount Sinai, it's called Jebel al Lors. That means the mountain of the law. It's also called Jebel Musa, which means the mountain of Moses. Now, also in this area, we, will, we find a split rock, 60 feet high, and I believe this is Mount Horeb. You remember Moses struck a rock and it split, and there is a friend of mine who I met at um, Derek Walker's church, Oxford Bible Church, a, a, a gentleman called Aaron Sen. And there you see Aaron Sen sitting at the bottom of Mount Horeb. And you'll notice that the the, the, the rocks there are all very smooth, suggesting that they have been eroded by the passage of millions of gallons of water. The last thing I want to mention to you is the rocks, some of the rocks there, and this is possi possibly um, the, uh, the golden calf altar, have drawings on them, and the drawings look like a calf. They're actually called petroglyphs. So that is a drawing of, uh, possibly a drawing of the golden calf. Now, these weren't any old calves that uh, the children of Israel were actually worshipping. These were Egyptian gods called um, Apis and Hathor, commonly known as the calf gods. They were, these were the pagan gods of uh, Egypt. So when the uh, children of Israel made a golden calf, they were actually worshipping the pagan gods of Egypt and breaking the Ten Commandments as they did so, which was why Moses was so cross. So there's three reasons why I think this may be the real Mount Sinai. Here is a Mount Sinai with a blackened top where possibly God came down in fire and turned the granite into obsidian, which is like molten glass. Secondly, there's a split rock there Mount Horeb, I believe, at the bottom of the base of Mount Horeb, the stone has all been uh, made smooth by the passage of millions of gallons of water. And thirdly, we have these uh, petroglyphs or ancient drawings of an Egyptian pagan god called Apis and Hathor. So I believe that Mount Sinai is just one more confirmation that the Bible is supernatural. We are, we are the disciples of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the supernatural God who created everything in existence, and everything in the Bible is true. Thank you for listening to me, and God bless. Welcome back to To The Point. Wow. <laughs> wow, Richard. What can I say? You know? Well, uh, I'm quite excited about this. As I said, this is actually the first time I've shown this on Revelation TV because um, some of these archaeological discoveries are uh, controversial, I would say. Uh, but since uh, Howard Condor very kindly wonderfully showed this last week on television, one of them is actually Howard's doing some fascinating work at the moment, um, but he showed this one, uh, this particular site as well. A gentleman flew over from America. Um, <clears throat> but I'll tell you what, the, the Christians are, uh, we're a funny lot, you know. Uh, uh, the Muslims don't have a problem with this being Mount Sinai. They, they, uh, if, you ask, if you go to Saudi Arabia and ask where is Mount Sinai, they don't call it Mount Sinai, they say, well, that's where it is. It's the tallest mountain in the area. It's called Jebel al Musa, the mountain of Moses, or Jebel al Laws, the mountain of the law, whichever you choose. They could call it both. They haven't got a problem with that at all. In fact, they put, bulb, they put um, a wire around it and made it um, a, a special government site where ordinary people can't go. And that's why uh, double, uh, sorry, Howard's. Uh, our Condor's um, guest last week, uh, he, what, he actually used one of these little flying drones to fly over the fence and take photographs, um, in order, because you can't go in there. Anyway, so I believe this is the real place. I definitely think it's not uh, St. Catherine's Monastery, because I think St. Catherine's Monastery, interesting place though it is, it's actually uh, several hundred miles away. It's in, it's in the Sinai Peninsula, it's not in Saudi Arabia. So it's got to be somewhere in Saudi Arabia. 
and I believe it's this place. And uh, it's fascinating that the children of Israel, they melted all their gold, which they, by the way, when they passed through the, <coughs> the Red Sea, eight miles, four million of them going through the Red Sea, they, 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 they took payment for 400, <coughs> 400 years' work and they got paid in gold and silver and lots of other things besides, but they melted all their gold down to make these golden calves. But it wasn't any old calf. They were making the gods of uh, where they come from, uh, those two uh, cow gods uh, were worshipped in uh, Egypt, where they just come from. And of course, the first commandment is, "Thou shalt worship no other god." Um, the Lord thy God is a jealous God, uh, and will tolerate no rivals. So they broke the first commandment, the, the first of the ten commandments. But Moses brought down. That's what it says. And God and Moses were very, very cross. They, they were worshipping an, an idol. Um, anyway, I think there's a lot. Uh, of course, there's Mount Horeb, that split rock there. And I have spoken to Aaron Sen. He stayed in my house. He's been there, um, and he's, he's actually been there. He said it's just stunning because it's, uh, it's a very arid place, and all the rocks are very sharp, and you have to be careful not to cut your fingers, except in this one place. Mount Horeb is 60 foot high and it's split, as you can see, but just at the base there, everything is smooth. He said, you know, it's, it's smooth like a glass tabletop. And suggesting that passage of millions of tons of, of water have flown there and, and made this um, bedrock smooth instead of all jagged like everywhere else in the area. All very, very fascinating stuff. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's fascinating. And, and recently, I've just been reading Exodus, actually. I think yes. I'm still in the late 30s of Exodus at the moment. And it's all, it actually really brings it to light what you're talking about now. And <laughs> Moses, you know, splitting the rock and dropping the, the commandments and having to go back up and get it again yes. and having his face all glowing and, of yes. course, leaving them down there yes. at the bottom where yes. they then, Aaron, due to peer pressure, due to pressure from all the grumbling Israelites, yes. <laughs> decided to uh, make their own God. Yes, they did. So they were taken out of Egypt, but they still had Egypt in them. Yes. In lots of ways, and the traditions, and, yeah. and the... Yeah. 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 Just to pick you up on one thing you said there. It's got nothing whatever to do with Mount Sinai, except that Moses went up to, and met God at the top of Mount Sinai. And as the Lord just said, when he came down, his face was glowing. His face was glowing. That's what it says in the scriptures. Mm. Now the thing is, what actually was what happened? What was going on here? I'm absolutely fascinated. Actually, um, I think the, the, the um, God is God is light, and in Him is there no darkness at all. So he, God is radiating light. Now, what are, what is light? Light is photons, uh, subatomic particles moving in a waveform. So, in the presence of God, you're in the presence of light massive amount of light. I'm quite sure Moses had to shield his eyes in the presence of God, otherwise his retinas would have been burned. But those photons uh, cause his uh, skin to, well, basically, uh, nu <laughs> nuclear, I'm not quite sure with nuclear fusion or nuclear fission, but some nuclear activity in his skin in order for his skin to glow light. And there's another place in scripture where that happened, of course, and that was at the transfiguration. Uh, when Jesus was actually in his uh, eternal body, he glowed with light. And so did Moses and Elijah. They, were, they came from eternity and they were there with him. And uh, Peter, James and John, you know, they saw these three characters glowing with light. Well, Moses was glowing with light when he came down from the presence of God. And of course, one thing to remember is that when we get to heaven, we're going to be glowing with light. Adam and Eve were glowing in light before they fell. Uh, even Lucifer was glowing with light before he fell. But when we get to heaven, we're going to be glowing with light. And it says in Daniel, that last, in Daniel 12, that some will be glowing brighter, well, all be growing bright, brightly like the stars forever, but some will be growing more, more, bright, more brightly than others. Now, I'm quite sure Laura will be growing much more brightly than I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's interesting you should say that because, you know, as you know, my mum is in heaven now, yes, sir. and um, my my dad and my sister were there, you know, just before she left, and my sister describes mum as being 
totally uncommunicating all day. She'd not said a word, she'd not eaten. And then suddenly she came back and she started glowing. My sister describes my mum as literally her eyes were glowing. Oh, right. And she was nodding her head and doing all this and glowing. That's how she describes her. And I can just imagine that mum must have gone over, come back and said, oh. I'm going to be all right, it's great. And then just... <laughs> And then within a few minutes, literally, she'd gone. Oh, wow. So it was, it's, it's wonderful and it's, it's something that we will all glow, but we, we have to have the transformed bodies to take it. You yes, know, we can't absolutely. sit in these yeah. mortal bodies yeah. of, you know, clay <laughs> and so we yeah. can't, we just can't. But yes, it's wonderful. There's something to look forward to, isn't yeah. it, really? That we'll be in his presence and his radiance will just reflect And on. thank you for that. And, 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 and it may well be that your mum did actually see beyond, because a lot of people have seen beyond. And by the way, I've written three books on near-death experiences, which is another subject I haven't discussed on Revelation TV. So, Jeff Lister, I know you're very interested in near-death experiences. You've told me on the phone, and thank you for writing to us. But if any, any other people would like to hear about near-death experiences, I've actually interviewed 300 people who've had near-death experiences and seen heaven and the other nasty place, which we don't like to talk about very much. Um, I've interviewed 300 people, written three books on the subject, and been made into two movies. Um, so if you'd like me to talk about near-death experiences, please write to e info at revelationtv.com and say, Dear Dr. Richard and Dr. Laura, please talk about near-death experiences, and we will. <laughs> or any other subject you'd like. Sorry, I interrupted that, but it's, no. it's, we keep coming with these really interesting things to talk about, don't we? But it's a blessed hope we have, isn't it, that one day we too will be transformed yeah. in an inkling of a, a quick twinkling of an eye or with it, whatever means. I tell you a mystery, we shall, we, shall, we shall not all die, we shall be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, this mortal flesh will put on immortality. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and we hope as you watch at Revelation TV that you too are inspired to come to know our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ so that one day you too will be transformed and you will have that wonderful experience while you're still on earth, the joy, the peace of knowing him, the blessed hope of the future as well. So um, keep watching and mm -hmm. keep listening. So we're going on to the next um, topic today, which is the garden tomb. <laughs> and by the way, I hope you're all going to go to Revelation TV's um, 16th birthday um, holiday in Israel, tour in Israel, which is coming up very shortly. So um, we, we look forward to seeing you there. And this is now, for those who've been to the garden tomb, you remember very well, it's a wonderful place to be, but I'm going to read first of all from John 19, verses 40 to 42. And it says, Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen and with spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So there lay Jesus, because of the Jews' preparation day, the tomb was nearby. Richard, now we're going to go to another fun fact. Yeah. And go this straight is about ahead. the garden tomb. Hello, my name's Richard Kent. I wanted today to talk about the garden tomb. Now, for me, the garden tomb is the center of the universe. I've been very fortunate, my wife and I have been to the garden tomb many times. I cannot look at you and promise that the garden tomb is the actual tomb in which Jesus was buried. Um, however, I think it's quite likely that that is where he was buried for a number of reasons. First of all, we're told that Jesus was crucified at a place called Golgotha. And here is Golgotha, which actually, um, the, the word Golgotha means skull. And I think you'll agree with me, that does look like a skull. And we're told that Jesus was buried nearby in a rich man's tomb. Now, look at that tomb. Uh, that has a huge stone over it, or had a huge stone over it. Most tombs were much smaller than that. But this was a large tomb, a freshly cut uh, tomb, um, and it was in a vineyard. We're told that it was in a vineyard. Now, what does a vineyard require in the Middle East? Answer a great deal of water. Now, it just happens that there is a massive amount of water actually in the garden tomb area. And there are very few areas outside the city walls where there are large quantities of water available in a cistern. 
Uh, there's a massive cistern here which makes it very likely that this in fact was the place where Jesus was, uh, was buried. Another reason we think this may well have been the right place is because uh, the Romans had the habit of crucifying people on public highways and Golgotha was right on what's called the Via Maris. And of course during Passover time there would be literally thousands and thousands of people going along the Via Maris and they couldn't escape seeing three crucified people right by the Damascus Gate. So we come back to the garden tomb. There's something else which actually is extraordinary, is if you ever have been to the garden tomb, or next time you go, if you look about six foot to the left of the door, you'll find the remains of an old Roman stake. Uh, it's been analysed, that stake, and found to be uh, metal covered in lead. It's, it's uh, from Roman times, and we're told that the great stone which was rolled across was sealed. Now, I don't know whether this is or is not, but it's possible that that stake um, is actually the original Roman stake that was used to seal the great stone. Um, this is the most wonderful place to visit. As far as I'm concerned, it's the center of the universe. And remember that Jesus was buried there, but he only stayed there for three days and three nights because the angel rolled back the great stone on, on Easter morning and Jesus rose from the dead. And uh, it, it's because Jesus rose from the dead that I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and have decided to follow Jesus Christ forever and forever in heaven in eternity. And I'm hoping that you will do as well if you haven't already decided to be a follower of Jesus. This probably is the place where Jesus was crucified. I can't promise it is. We'll, we'll only know that for sure when we get to heaven. But it certainly is a very peaceful and wonderful place. It certainly is uh, very near Golgotha, the place of crucifixion. It certainly is on the Via Maris. It certainly has got a cistern there. There's a great deal of water there necessary for a vineyard. And for me, it's the centre of the universe and on the door is a sign which says, He is not here for he has risen. And the response by most Christians is to say, he, he has risen indeed. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and has appeared to literally hundreds of people before he actually went to heaven again after the resurrection and has been changing lives ever since. Thank you for listening and God bless. Welcome back to To The Point. Richard, that was exciting, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I do love the garden too, I have to say. I was there just a few months ago, um, less than five months actually, with a friend of mine who had never been. Yeah. So it was her first time going to Israel, and of course it's yeah. been my ninth or tenth yeah. time. And, and as you said, the piece of the garden tomb, um, and it's changed slightly now, they've slightly organised it, and they've actually removed the door with the sign. Oh, and now we're not allowed to take photos there, uh, oh. you know, so it, it's, oh. it's kind of okay. changed a little bit. But but it was still so wonderful to go yeah. there and the peace of just sitting there in all the different sections with all the other churches and groups praising and worshipping. The atmosphere, the atmosphere of praise and worship, it just fills the atmosphere completely. So it's one of my favourite places I had to say in Jerusalem. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and, uh, and of course there is this uh, controversy with that garden tomb which is in East Jerusalem and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Yes. Uh. <laughs> which is right by the Praetorium. Yes. Um, now, um, crucifixion is very, very nasty business, actually, and I'm not going to talk about that now, but I'll tell you what, the Romans would not want to have crucifixion right on their doorstep. In fact, they actually chose, I believe, uh, they chose the place where the Jew Jewish people traditionally did um, capital punishment. And, for example, Ste Stephen was stoned to death at Golgotha. That place, ever since Jerusalem became a city, that's where capital punishment took place and, they, and the Romans simply carried on at the same place. Uh, it was on this Via Maris and lots of people what passed by on, their road, on the way, it's a major route, 
Um, and they saw people being crucified, literally three, just raised three foot off the, off the floor, not right up there. They wanted eye to eye contact. That's what they wanted, really nasty business crucifixion. They wanted eye to eye contact with people who actually being crucified. And so they just raised them just three foot off the floor. That's it. So they could watch them. Very nasty business. How much time have we got? A uh, couple of minutes, probably. <laughs> well, um, I'm well known for being controversial. In fact, there are, there are people on, on the internet who actually think I'm a complete nutcase, and maybe they're right. <laughs> One of the things I'm controversial about is the actual linen in, in which uh, Jesus was buried when you go to the original Greek. Now, when Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus, he came out wearing grave clothes, and they're that's called kairos, and they're like bandages. And he had a sudarin, like a handkerchief, around his face. Well, Jesus also in Greek had a, a face cloth over his face called a sudarian. It's now in Oviedo in Spain. But the actual robe in which Jesus was buried was not a kairos like Lazarus was. It's, it's described in two ways in the original Greek. It's described as a thonia, which is a large sail, because Peter had a vision in the book of Acts and a thonia came down from heaven with lots of animals in it. So something the size of a large sail um, also is described as a syndon. Well, we don't really know what a syndon is, so we do what's called an Englishman's search and we see where else that word comes in. But it comes at the end of the book of Mark, where Mark himself ran from the Garden of Gethsemane, leaving behind his syndon. He was wrapped in a syndon. So whatever Jesus was buried in, buried in, it was unusual. It was a very large piece of linen. I believe that it was uh, what we now call the Shroud of Turin, which has supernatural uh, markings on it of a re resurrected Jesus Christ. Uh, you may have seen other programs from that, but I actually believe that. Um, and furthermore, I don't believe that any scientist today could, could uh, create those uh, photonegative three-dimensional properties on the Shroud of Turin, it's simply not possible, given all the technology available for anybody on planet Earth to create a Shroud of Turin. In photonegative and three-dimensional imaging, and I believe the Shroud of Turin proves the resurrection. But that's highly controversial. Um, that's what I believe. And it's not that... Uh, I, my, my challenge is, OK, if you don't think it's supernatural, go tell me how you would make it. Just how would you make it? Because nobody can. And reproduce it as well, because if you can, if you know how something's made, yeah. you can, you know, if it's that easy to do, you yeah. can surely reproduce it. But on that note, we're going to say thank you so much for watching us again today on To The Point. It's been great to have your pleasure. We're back on next time and look forward to seeing you again. Info at Revelation TV if you want to communicate with us and we'd love to see you again. God bless you. <laughs>